it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. is said is a dangerous place, not because of the people who are evil, no, but because of the people who don't do anything about it, as we will witness in tonight's story. The Mad Prophet Well, I've seen a lot of shit in my day as a detective, from brutal murders committed by intelligent killers to simple killings from gunshot wounds to the head or chest, but for the past year, I've investigated what appeared to be some type of ritualistic murders that didn't match up with anything else I'd seen or heard before. Each crime scene was the same. Four victims ranging from early 20s to late 40s, naked, wrists bound by rope, knelt down surrounding a tree with their heads snapped backwards where their faces would be facing the sky, except all of their eyes were missing and each and every one of them had this strange eight-pointed star carved into their backs with one eye in each triangle and a monstrous mouth of teeth branded in the center of the star. The killer had left no fingerprints, not a single trace for us to track down and find the bastard. That was until he called us from his own phone and gave us his exact address. He told us he was ready to be taken in. Well, I didn't get to hear his voice since I was talking to my boss, Curious as to why he wanted us to find him, but eager to bring down that son of a bitch, we pounced on the opportunity. This fucker lived out in the rural area of the state. Swat and my partner and I drove all the way to this killer's house in the dead of night. I can still remember that night vividly. It was raining hard as hell. The spring air was unusually colder than it normally was, and even though my partner and I were anxious to get this bastard... We both couldn't shake this feeling of an odd, subtle dread. 2.28 a.m. That's when we arrived at the killer's house in this clearing in the forest of oak trees whose dark shadows seemed to give off this eerie feeling like they themselves were watching us. The house was one story, almost the size of a trailer home. Only the front room light of the house was on. It was this gloomy green. The SWAT team surrounded the house and then busted inside. My partner and I followed behind them. Once we entered the house, we were hit by this strange smell. It was oddly sweet, yet stank simultaneously. And all over the walls were ominous and insane writings and drawings of eyes in black paint, in marker and in crayon. We found the killer kneeling on the floor in the center of the room, with his hands cuffed behind his back. He seemed to have torn out his own eyes. There were still bleeding scratches around the sockets that ran up his forehead and all over his face. Then he lifted his head up to face me, and I swear to Christ, I felt like he could see me as if he still had eyes. Detectives, he said in a light, gentle voice, acknowledging our presence. Good to finally meet you both. Get him the fuck out of here, I told the SWAT members who had hold of him. They took him outside and escorted him all the way back to headquarters to later be interrogated. Meanwhile, my partner, Detective Thomas, and I examined the house with forensics and about five police officers while others examined the surrounding area of the house. Now the writings on the walls, as I said, were somewhat deranged and ominous. I'll share some examples with you. Sees us all. Inside and outside, it watches us. Knows us. Wants us. Love and hate. Merely designs. Strings. Everything has strings. Everything is strings. Past, present, future. See all at once. Everywhere all at once. But where is it? Find where it resides outside. I am its puppet. I am its voice speaking to itself. They got it all wrong. They're all insane. Just like me, but in different ways. But I see, I know, and I know. They come as they're made to. Just like how I was made to call them after my last piece of the same message. Well, that last message was the most coherent out of all of them, and it actually made the air feel like it had turned colder. 
Hey, Carter. Thomas called to me as he walked down the hallway to me from the bedroom. He was holding what appeared to be a custom-made black hardcover book. Thomas handed me the book. Hey, take a look at this. I flipped through the pages and saw the most peculiar and eerie sketches and drawings of what I could best describe as masses of eyes with dozens of insect-like legs of many kinds coming out with writhing tentacles as well. Each sketch was varied in size, sometimes in shape and form too. Then I discovered that some were even humanoid, yet still composed of the same lidless, multi-irised eyes with one single black pupil in the centre and writhing tentacles and insect legs. With each page I flipped, I felt this sense of unsettling vileness gradually build up more and more. I had to stop before the coming nausea got a bit too strong, closing it immediately and handing it back to Thomas, who ended up handing it to the forensics. Fucking weird, right? Thomas commented. Yeah, yeah, I coughed. Anything else found? Yeah, the guy mostly had a wardrobe of Walmart cheap clothes, such as black pants, a hoodie, jacket, emerald green plain t-shirts. No jewelry except for the old black watch and the two rings he had on him. A cabinet of his paint supplies with the markers and crayons are in his bedroom. Shelves with some books on the occult, astronomy, psychology, ancient world history books, and two books that kind of, well, stand out among the rest. What are they? I asked. One of the forensic members handed me the two. One was titled, The Existence of Pure Evil. And the cover art was of a valley of red flowers, dark green grass and pine green maple trees under a pinkish blue sky at sundown. Well, I felt that familiar feeling of pure foulness bloom again inside me. I quickly turned my eyes to the other book, which was titled in violet font saying, Dark Meditation with a black silhouette of a figure in the lotus position, with an eye similar to the ones in the book of drawings in the center of the head. I handed the books back to the forensic member and said to Thomas, Well, this explains quite a bit. Anything else? Not really, Thomas replied. Just some bread, cereal, and a cup of noodles in the pantry. Some meat in the fridge with a couple of cartons of milk, some cheese, and pears as well. Gotta say, though, I've never seen anything like this in 15 years, man. Same for me, Thomas, I agreed as I looked around at the writings and drawings on the wall. That sense of wrongness lingered in the air. Ah, this shit is something else. I don't freaking like it. Any ideas where all the victims' eyes are? If you kept them here or somewhere else? No clue yet. We'll ask the sick fuck when we get him back to headquarters. Alright, well, let's go ask him then. We headed back outside, where it had finally stopped raining. Once we got back in our car, we headed straight to headquarters, where we'd plan on interrogating this self-proclaimed mad prophet. An hour later, we got back to HQ and were on our way to the interrogation room. Thomas told me he wanted me to interrogate the son of a bitch alone. I asked him why. He looked at me with fear in his eyes fear I'd never seen before. Now, we've been in a few intense shootouts and seen some brutal shit, but he always kept his cool. But this, this was like he knew that if he entered the same room as the sick fuck we'd just caught, that some fucked up nightmare would come to life and swallow him whole. And lately, I'm starting to think he was right. I, I just feel sick, he said softly, like he was trying his darndest to speak, but he was drugged and it was suppressing his ability to say a complete sentence. Something in that... <laughs> Something in that house. Go home then, man, I told him, patting him on the back. Get some rest and check with your doctor soon. Thomas just nodded and walked quickly to the exit and left. I took a deep breath and entered the dimly lit room that saw through the one-way mirror into the interrogation room. A couple of security guards and Officer Phillips, one of the police officers who was at the house as well, were watching the mad prophet, who was just sitting still, staring at the wall opposite him. Officer Phillips filled me in on the mad prophet's personal information. His name is Rowan Linegrain, Caucasian male, auburn hair, 35 years old, 185 pounds, 
His date of birth is California. Lives on his own. Had the house for five years. Family's been living in Oregon ever since he got the house, while he's stayed in state. What's he been doing? He's just been sitting there, humming to himself ever since the moment the SWAT team got him in their truck and brought him here. Humming? I asked, kind of confused but not entirely surprised. Yeah, just humming this weird, creepy tune. Also, the SWAT team that escorted him said they smelled a sweet, stinky smell, just like the one from his house. Have you got any news about where the victim's eyes are? I asked Officer Phillips. No, not yet, unfortunately. We tried getting the bastard to tell us, but he kept telling us that he'd tell you guys. Officer Phillips then looked behind us and noticed that Thomas wasn't with us. Oh, speaking of which, where is Detective Thomas? Uh, he went home, I told him. My eyes locked onto the mad prophet. Detective Thomas fell sick, so I'll be doing the interrogation by myself. All right, well, he's all yours then. I took another deep breath and walked up to the door leading into the interrogation room. One of the security guards unlocked the door and let me in, closing and locking it behind me. Once I stepped into that room, I felt that same uneasy foulness in the air like back in the mad prophet's house when I was flipping through his book of drawings and that book, The Existence of Pure Evil. And Rowan's humming of that unsettling song wasn't helping at all. It almost sounded like the Aphex Twins track Grass, but the pitch was lowered and distorted a bit. Rowan stopped humming once I sat down across the table from him, where he sat chained to his chair. Detective, Rowan said with an unpleasant smile. Where's your partner? Well, he's uh, not feeling too well, I told him. Now, since I've answered your question, how about you answer mine? Where's all 24 of your victims' eyes? I'm assuming you haven't found them. Rowan's voice had a soft and dreamy tone, but with a sinister feel to it. Are they in the deep of the woods at your place? I asked him. They're not there. You're looking in the wrong spots. You're looking in the wrong place. It doesn't matter anyways. They have them right now. They? Who's they? You've already seen them. Where? In my drawing book. You mean to tell me that those weird fucked up things you drew took all 24 of your victims' eyes? You know, I don't like being lied to. Oh, those weird fucked up things are called angels. But I understand you didn't know that's what they are. I'm telling the truth, and yes, the angels have all of their eyes. Besides, they don't need them where they are now. What do you mean where they are now? They're in a frickin' morgue, no thanks to you. Rowan let out a vile chuckle. They're spirits, detective. Their spirits is what I meant, not their bodies. Their spirits are in a much more beautiful place right now. Well, not beautiful to some, I suppose. What place? You saw a nice little depiction of it, Rowan told me. And that vile air became gradually thicker. I know you looked at that book, The Existence of Pure Evil. One of the best books, if not the best, I've ever read. I've been to that place as depicted on the cover and talked about in the book, and I strongly doubt you even read much of it. Would you like me to tell you what it talks about? The wonderful information and truth it shares? It may help you understand why he killed those 24 beautifully violated souls. It may give you some of the answers you're looking for. I had to admit some suddenly sickening curiosity overcame me. I should have just asked the questions I'd left for him, but I wanted to know. For some odd reason, I wanted to know. No, not need, I just wanted to know. All right then, I said with a deep breath. Tell me what it says. I'll do my best to summarize and simplify it as much as I can for you. Rowan told me with a sickly satisfied smile. But you'll learn more when you actually read the whole book for yourself. If you choose to. Oh, where to begin? Oh, yes. So let's start with the basic examples of evil. 
Evil is and can be people who steal, murder, abuse, manipulate and violate for their own benefit. Well, everyone knows that, I suppose. But what about pure evil? To most religious people, pure evil is the devil or Satan. Ron let out another vile yet short chuckle. <laughs> Bitch, please. Did they even read their holy books? Satan, the devil, or whatever the fuck you want to call him, rebelled against a lying version of God because he was a cocky or narcissistic guy who didn't like his dad or just didn't agree with him. Really? That made the guy pure evil? Did they even read any book on demonology? There are demons that are so fucking pure evil that every other demon, including Satan himself, despises them. Anyways, pure evil is not a person. Oh, pure evil is a force, like a force of nature, an ancient force that's highly likely older than time itself, if that makes any sense, and sole purpose or intention, if it even has a consciousness to have intentions, violates everything and anything it touches, that it is even the tiniest speck of goodness and innocence in them, and it violates indiscriminately. Well, if we exclude, of course, the certain vessels it uses to spread its influence and presence, because how can you violate something that's already defiled? Hmm, and I'm assuming you're one of those vessels. I slowly said to him, noticing right at that moment that it was gradually becoming a bit more difficult to speak. Yes, Rowan replied with a grin of pride. I'm a bit of a prophet, to spread its great word and spirit. Anyways, this force of pure evil doesn't really have a base form, not a form we can really wrap our minds around, but we can definitely feel it, and there are places where we can feel it stronger than others, possibly the strongest, such as the place depicted on the cover of that book I mentioned earlier. That place really exists. Not here, well, okay, you can't really get there unless you make a bridge and cross it. And I know, I know you'd like to know how. How? I asked. Speaking was getting even more difficult now. It was like I was drugged, but I wasn't, though. And that unholy feeling in the air was getting stronger. How to make a bridge to a place where pure evil is stronger or strongest? Rowan began. You must defile something considered holy or pure, like a holy symbol or holy place or a holy statue. No, oh, I'm not talking about humping a statue of the Virgin Mary. I'm talking about painting the vilest shit possible on it, or on the walls of the chapel. Or, like what I did. Carve an eight-pointed star that represents salvation from Judeo-Christian beliefs. But I carved in the eyes of the angels you saw in my drawing book, to make the bridge stronger and also to mark the victims more easily for the angels to come pick them up. You see... The angels, as they are referred to in the book, are angels of pure evil, as you've probably figured out by now. They are its much more ancient servants and also helpers of those who want to complete the bridge and cross it. What about the mouth? That's supposed to symbolize the mouth of pure evil itself, swallowing the spirits of its victims into its depths. And honestly, the symbol I carved fitted perfectly, especially since... You know, eight points. Eight symbolizes infinity. Pure evil is infinite, that whole thing. So, after I mark the victims, one of the angels comes to take the four victims' eyes. And oh my freaking God, is it the most blissfully violating feelings ever? Well, violating if you were still somewhat pure or whatever. Still, when they arrive, that vile atmosphere they bring is so intense. It'd make an entire city of people feel like they were getting violated by their loved ones in a cathedral. But for me, well, it was pure pleasure. The way he moaned that last sentence in foul pleasure began to make my already sickened insides feel like they were tearing at each other. But Rowan continued. And just for your information, you only need eight victims to do your little sacrifice to enter that lovely place where pure evil can be felt near its peak. But I decided to add sixteen more. Because <laughs> why not? Well, I enjoyed it. I wanted more people to experience that beautiful place. Which finally brings us to the details about a place of pure evil. 
A place to have pure evil's presence at its strongest must be a place that looks beautiful, or a place that looks like it was once holy or sacred. And that place is defiled by pure evil itself. Now this place isn't reachable on this earth without a bridge, but you can cross that bridge finally after you've sacrificed your eight or more victims by simply reciting some verses or chants found in the book, which I'll leave you to find out for yourself. After those last words of his, it went quiet for two straight minutes, which I swear to Christ felt like hours. For some damn reason I couldn't explain at the time, that I knew, I just knew that Rowan was telling me the truth about every single thing. But I'd find out for sure myself later that month that what he told me was real, that it is real. I got up from my chair and had the security guard unlock the door for me. Quickly I left the room, but once I got into the hallway, I fell to the floor onto my knees, almost dry heaving. Hey, Detective Carr. Officer Phillips called to me. He ran up to my side and asked, Are you feeling okay? Need me to call you an ambulance? No. I stopped him with a gasp as I shook my head. Gradually I started to feel better, but I needed to get as far away as I could from Rowan. Take that fuck back to his cell, please. After I get home, of course. I got back up to my feet, my breathing slowly becoming less and less heavy. This is freaking weird, Detective Carter, Officer Phillips told me. I forgot to mention this. I don't know why I forgot, but when he was brought here to HQ, we didn't find any disease or chemical-related shit on him. Nothing that caused people such as yourself to dry heave and get sick like that. Plus the guys who were in the truck with him, watching him, they said they felt ill after getting him in there. Not like with the flu, just, well, sick in the gut and uneasy as hell. Something just feels very wrong about that bastard. I don't like it at all. Well, I doubt anyone likes it, I replied as I wiped some of the sweat from my face. But I gotta get back home. I gotta get some rest. Keep a careful eye on him, Phillips. You call me right away if anything happens. Will do. Just make sure you get some sleep. Yeah, I muttered as I walked to the exit. If I can sleep at all tonight. I did get some sleep, but my dreams were some of the most vivid nightmares I'd had in years. And what happened next somehow made things worse, even though Rowan was behind bars. He died in his cell. Rowan somehow died around 8am while I was asleep back at my house. Well, I rushed right over after Officer Phillips caught me as soon as they'd found him lying cold in his bed. I showed up, still in my clothes from yesterday, and walked quickly to his cell where Officer Phillips was standing dumbfounded at what had just happened. How the hell did he die? I asked Phillips as I checked Rowan's body for any sign of poison or self-inflicted wounds. I don't freaking know, Detective, Phillips answered me. We checked the video feed watching his cell and it showed nothing but him going to sleep. Nothing of him slid in his wrists or neck or swallowing anything that could have been poison. And Rowan's body supported Phillips' story. I couldn't find a damn trace of any self-inflicted wounds. Officer Phillips let me check out the video footage of Rowan's cell, showing every second of what he did. And he was right. There was not a single moment where he swallowed anything or even where he'd cut his vital arteries or neck. All we could do was hope the autopsy would show something that we believe we might have missed. But still, it wasn't right. With Rowan being dead before he could have gone to court and be tried for his crimes, and where the families of his victims would have seen him rightfully executed. And what Officer Phillips told me next didn't make things any better. All the other prisoners close by him told us the same thing of around the time Rowan died. Phillips told me as we walked down the hall to the front doors. They all said they felt something vile, Something so foul that they almost began to cry. Cry? I asked as we passed through the front doors and out into the cool morning air. Yeah, almost began to cry from complete fear. Oh, fuck. I have to check up on Thomas and update him on this. Hope he's doing alright. Also, uh, Phillips, I've got a favor to ask you. Sure, what? I'm going to need to have printed photocopies of two of Rowan's books. Yeah, sure, Detective Carter, Philip said as he pulled out a pen and notepad. Which ones? 
I need photocopies of the existence of pure evil and that dark meditation one as soon as you can. Especially when I get back after I check up and update Detective Thomas on this whole situation. Got it. I'll get those two copied for you and ready by the time you get back. Thanks. I tried calling Thomas's phone once I got in my car, but he didn't pick up at all. So I drove to his house, which took me about ten minutes. He lived in the suburban area of the city, same place where my house was at, except I was about ten blocks away from where he lived. Once I quickly parked in front of his lawn, I turned off the car and walked quickly to his front door, knocking on it loud enough to hopefully wake him up. Thomas did eventually end up opening the door. He was in a tank top and gym shorts. Carter, he asked with squinted eyes, looking like he'd just woken up. Hey man, how's it going? How'd the interrogation go with Rowan? Thomas, I said to him, looking into those brown eyes of his. Rowan just died this morning. <laughs> no wonder I feel better. Well, his reply took me by surprise. W wait, what? I stuttered. Well, I gotta be honest with you. The fuck made me feel sick, I mean, literally. Even without touching the bastard, I felt like I was gonna seize up or vomit from just being in the same room as him. That's why I'm grateful you did the interrogation instead of me. Because, uh, to be honest, if I did it with you, I probably would have ended up in hospital. Don't ask me why. I just know that that's how it would have played out. Something was really wrong with that fuck. And I couldn't be happier that he's dead. And I, well, I know it may sound weird, especially after that last psychopath we caught back in 2017. How I handled everything fine back then, but I honestly couldn't wait till Rome was dead. I'm glad he is. Anyways, was there something else you wanted to tell me? Oh, no, not really. Hey, did you call your doctor at all? No, didn't need to. Like I said, I'm fine now. Woke up feeling much better than last night. I'll come into the station in an hour. Just gotta take a shower and get some breakfast. Okay, I'll see you there then. Thomas just nodded and closed the door in front of me. I got back into my car and returned to the station after picking up some breakfast on the way back. When I got to my desk, I noticed a pocket folder with the words Dark Meditation written on it, with the photocopies of the actual book paper clipped together in size. I flipped through the pages and noticed there were eight chapters and 150 pages in total. And there was no author listed anywhere in it at all. Thomas showed up right when he said he would, and to be honest, he actually looked much better than he had the night before. What you got there? He asked me as he sat at his desk across from mine. Dark meditation, I answered him as I began to read it from the beginning. I asked Officer Phillips if he could photocopy those two books we'd found at Ron's house for me. I'm assuming he's still working on getting the other one copied right now. Well, enjoy reading that spooky shit, he joked. I'm going to work on letting the families of the victims know that the bastard's finally dead after I let the boss know that I'm okay. Oh, fine by me. Thomas left and I stayed glued to my chair, reading every passage of my photocopy of Dark Meditation. The peculiar and obviously dark book talked about the history of the ways of well, how to gain grim, ancient forbidden knowledge, how to communicate and come in contact with dark otherworldly entities from nightmarescapes simply called the Dreadful Ones, and unwelcomed alien beings known as the Foul Angels, oh, and how to travel to those nightmarescapes and places of evil. Most of the methods to achieve what one desired of what was listed in this book was performing sinister or considerably unholy and strange rituals. The last two methods were chance to gain that dark knowledge and communicate with a dreadful one. It took me about four hours to finish the whole damn thing. As I was going over it again to start highlighting stuff, Officer Phillips came up to me and handed me another pocket folder with the words The Existence of Pure Evil written on the front. Yeah, I got this one done for you, he told me as I skimmed through it. He noticed I had dark meditation opened up with a few passages already highlighted. Find any valuable info in that one? He asked, pointing his finger to it. Mm, some, I replied as I continued to skim through the other photocopy book. You remember those weird creepy sketches in that drawing book he had? Yep. Well, the descriptions of some of these foul angels that are mentioned in the book match a few of those drawings. 
What about the others? Nothing. I don't think he saw the rest himself. Hallucinated them or dreamt them. Besides, the ones listed in the book are only examples anyways. Three out of the twelve, to be exact. As for the other beings talked about... Weird. Well, I'm going to go home. Done with my shift. Good luck with all that. Uh, thanks. Later that day, Thomas told me how talking to some of the families had gone, and we went over all the shit that had happened with Rowan, from his first killings to his unexpected death. As the next two weeks passed by, I read both photocopies of Dark Meditation and the existence of pure evil thoroughly, highlighting specific passages that stood out to me. While the existence of pure evil went into more detail about the foul angels and the places of pure evil, along with a perspective written about pure evil as a force itself. Also, with murderous rituals that almost exactly aligned with what Rowan had done. As I read that particular book, Rowan's words to me echoed through my mind. What he told me during his interrogation matched perfectly with what was detailed in the book. The thing is, when he told me these things, he said it with such confidence and conviction, like he himself actually met with the foul angels and went to those places where pure evil's presence was at its strongest. And, as I mentioned in the previous part, I really believed him. And reading those two books just supported my belief and my gut feeling that he had told me the truth. But the horrible thing, though, was that I was soon to see for myself the reality of it all. On the Thursday night of the final week of that month, out of an ever-growing insatiable curiosity to see it for myself, out of some insane need for some deranged form of closure, I performed one of the rituals listed in Dark Meditation. 11.15pm is when I began the ritual, naked in my very home. Rather than killing innocent people, I took the ashes of my deceased wife and carefully poured them onto the velvet red carpet into an eight-pointed star and drew an eye in each triangle and a horrific mouth in the centre, just like the one Rowan had carved into his victim. I then pushed myself to masturbate and use my semen to smear the ashes into the carpet. Then I began the incantation in a soft-spoken voice with my eyes closed. Oh, angels of pure evil, I spoke softly. Oh, foul angels of the one true God, I make this unholy mark as a sacrifice, an offering for you, for one of you to come unto me. Come unto me, O oh great foul one, for I desire to go where the presence of the one true God, pure evil itself, is strongest, so I may bathe in its violating touch and experience its vile beauty. Come unto me, O oh foul one, come unto me, come unto me. Suddenly I began to feel something awful getting closer to me. I can't say where from exactly, it was as if it was coming from every direction. The vile feeling became stronger and stronger, soon surpassing the intensity of when I was in the interrogation room with Rowan. And then it got to a point where I began dry heaving and eventually vomited red bile right into the centre of the mouth drawn from my dead wife's ashes. My eyes were watering as my hands gripped the fabric of the carpet tightly. Then something told me to lift my head up to face the wall across the room. And that's where I saw it appear fading slowly into existence. It was an atrocious abomination to reality, to my very eyes. The form of it was mostly transparent, but with a gloomy, greenish light to it. But I could see its numerous writhing, insect-like legs that came from the outline of its sphere-like centre, where there were countless soul-penetrating eyes. It felt like this went on for hours, that foul one violating my mind with images of every unholy ritual and vile atrocity it had committed. And then, suddenly, all of it stopped, with my vision going black and the feeling of vileness quickly dissipating. My vision came back slowly, but I was no longer in the living room of my house. No, I was somewhere else. Somewhere that I should never have gone to. A valley of nauseatingly red flowers, dark grotesquely green grass, and sickly pine green maple trees blown by a lukewarm breeze under a vile pinkish blue sky at sundown. No, I groaned in slowly building fear. 
No. No, no. No. And then it began. A feeling of pure evil, fouler than that of the abomination I'd seen in my house, quickly flooding through my entire being. Oh, God, no one should ever feel something like that. It felt like I was being violated while I witnessed my wife being raped in front of me over and over and over again, inside the very church we'd been married in, but intensified beyond what my mind and soul could endure. It felt so fucking violating, so overwhelmingly violating that I began to cry out of absolute fear, not just for my sanity, but for my very soul. I wish, though, I had been driven insane. That would have been a mercy. But there, in that seemingly beautiful place, with the most vilest feelings in all of comprehension, I wasn't allowed to have my mind shatter into the blissful obliviousness of insanity. No, I was forced to endure it all, every single nanosecond. I would writhe and roll back and forth as I groaned and screamed through my clenched teeth like a feral animal as tears constantly ran down my face. I tried as much as I could to pray to whatever god to save me from that evil place, but the mental prayers I tried saying in my mind wouldn't last more than five seconds. They'd be interrupted and replaced by horrific images and scenes that are too sinister and depraved to even describe. All those poor souls were violated in both comprehensible and incomprehensible ways, and I could see my wife among them. Was it weeks, months, years, or decades of my mental and spiritual agony there? I can't tell, forcing myself to look back now. It never got darker or lighter. It was eternally sundown, just like that. I don't remember how I got back. All I do remember after that was waking up, back in my living room. I spent a good hour straight, crying out of fear from what had just happened to me. But as I felt something drip down my thighs from my anus, the relief of being back from that horrid place was soon torn to shreds. I touched the sticky substance from my inner thigh and looked to my horror. It smelled like a sickly, sweet and stinky smell. Well, later, I tried washing and cleaning the stained symbol out of the carpet, but it had left its mark permanently. I managed to get most of the ashes out, though. Still, I regret doing that with my wife's ashes, and I regret reading those books. I regret doing that ritual. I deeply regret it all. But I have to live with that now for the rest of my life, and quite possibly for the rest of eternity. I burn those photocopies of the books, but all of what I've read from them has seared into my mind. Every night I have dreams of that foul place, and of that foul angel. I'm thinking of tearing up the red carpet and getting a new one. But I'm conflicted because my wife loved that carpet, yet I defiled it with what I've done. Nothing helps distract me or gives me relief from what happened. And nothing will help. And the worst part of it all is that I have this deep, strong feeling in my gut that after I die, I'll be taken back to that place of pure evil. And will stay there. Forever. So, um, quick shout out to everyone who's been inquiring about my job interview and how it went. Um, don't want to say too much yet, but it seems to be going over, you know, all right. <laughs> so, pretty happy with that. Thanks for your concerns and all your well wishes. And what else has been happening? Oh, just had my first coronavirus jab uh, for the vaccine. Uh, very painless so far. <laughs> nope, doing all right. <laughs> but again, I'll wait and see how that goes. So yeah, that was one from The Vault, the subreddit I set up so you can share your stories with me, and I try to read as many from there as I can. So um, if you've written anything, please consider um, putting it in my subreddit, and who knows, I might get around to reading it. Well, the weekend is upon us. Summer's here in the Northern Hemisphere. Things seem to be looking up a little bit. So, wishing you all a great weekend. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.